And so a lot of people are probably heard about Archambault or Mabiglia Mori, because it's sometimes called, and there's been a little discussion through the co-op recently. Uh, I'm just going to go through our database listings here. Mark records are on the way, which I will talk about in a few minutes, but we don't have them yet. Uh, there it is. The English. Well, you can log in with my card. Oh, yeah. Sure. <laughs> I'll, I'll do mine just because like, you, you might not have an account yet, in which oh, case I'll take a second. Uh, sorry, guys. Bear with me. Okay, here we go. So when your users first um, come to your Madeline and Marie collection, this is what they'll see. I'll go from here. Um, so Archambault is a company that's based in Quebec, so they are Canadian. Um, and they offer, um, really what we were interested in is their French ebook collection, which is quite robust um, and quite up to date, which is great. They have European publishers as well as Canadian ones. Most of the ebook content is um, primarily French language origin, which is great. So it's writers who are French writing in French in Europe and in Canada. Uh, but they do have some popular works in translation too, which is great. So especially a lot of children's and YA titles, things like Diary of a Wicked Kid, and Twilight, etc. You can get those in French through the collection as well. Um, I wasn't involved in the initial assessment of what was out there for French ebooks, but my understanding from Julie and others is that we wanted to wait this long because we really wanted something that was um, a really sort of up-to-date, dynamic, growing collection. We didn't want to offer a bunch of old, random, translated French books and then not have anyone ever want to come back to that collection. And so this was the one for us. So I'm just going to log in here. Um, what's nice about them, and this might have more applicability to consortium access than to BPL because we're doing this standalone, is they do offer support for multi-branch systems. So each branch could actually have its own um, log in here, which is why I have to go through the drop down. Just for me to have a little bit of a visual to go along with this. There we go. So here's our front page. You can see they've let us customize it with colors, with the logo, etc. Um, so we've negotiated a budget with them based on our own budget as well as uh, their estimation of how many new titles per month that match our collection profiles will be coming up. Um, they also did a little bit of estimation for us based on what the existing Canadian public libraries that they were already doing business with were purchasing, which was nice, so we got a real sense of how much we'd be spending. Um, we started with an initial seed collection of about 4,000 titles uh, over Christmas, and uh, some of you might have seen the hopefully accurate French tweet that I put together on like December 28th when nobody else was around <laughs> when we launched the collection. Um, and then since then we've been buying roughly 75 titles per month, um, a mix of adult fiction and nonfiction as well as um, children's and teen uh, fiction and nonfiction. And they build carts for us in their selections module, which is great. Um, they base it on collection profiles that we gave them up front that pretty much match the collection profiles we use for our other ebook collections like Overdrive, so really focused on popular and, um, and contemporary content. Um, what else do I want to say here about that? So I do a spot check of the cards when they're ready to go each month, but that's really mostly for duplicates and for format. They do offer ebooks in both EPUB and PDF, um, and we've been clear with them that we really just want the EPUBs, so I do a spot check for that as well. Uh, the marketplace is pretty comprehensive. Um, check carts, put them through on our own as purchases. Uh, they provide a customizable site. Um, authentication is a combination of our regular referring URL, so through our database listings, um, as well as their system checking for the VPL card prefix. So this collection is actually open to anybody. Um, you don't have to be a resident of Vancouver. They're pretty flexible on that, but you do have to have a VPL issued card with that 21383 prefix. Um, interestingly, when we started working with them, we learned pretty early on that they didn't have any kind of codified um, privacy policy in terms of what they do with user information, but they were very open to drafting one based on our recommendations. So they have one now. <laughs> Thanks to uh, mostly Kay's work, and I did a little bit of work 
work on it as well. Um, so they do have one of those now and they were happy to put that in place. Um, the borrowing process is EPUB download only, so they don't have like a browser-based reader. Um, and officially, their EPUBs are um, compatible with Bluefire Reader, which some of you might be familiar with. It's another e-reading app that uses DRM similarly to the Overdrive app. Um, the titles can work with Overdrive. I had like a moment of triumph at Christmas where in my Overdrive app I had an Overdrive title, a Biblio Digital title, and an Archimbo title all working, but uh, it's not 100% of the time and it's not officially supported. So officially in all of our help documentation, we, uh, we direct reader, readers to use Bluefire. Um, the custom site, um, if I log in with our admin, um, log in through this same interface. I get uh, some reports and an analytics module. It's not the most intuitive set of reports in the world. Some of that is to do with the translation, I think, but they were very open to giving me like quite a long, in-depth, one-on-one walkthrough of all the <laughs> modules and information that I would need. Uh, so the customer service has been really good. Working with them in English, with my like French that stopped at grade 11, um, really hasn't been a problem. They're very responsive in English on the phone and um, through email as well. And they've been really eager to uh, address any questions that we have. Um, the service has been great. There's in-depth discussions and training with them when we need it. Um, I will say that the process of getting the MARC records so that we can have these titles be discoverable through our collection has been pretty slow, partially because they had um, a staff turnover at Christmas and the guy who I had been dealing with and who was sort of knee deep in the MARC records was suddenly gone. <laughs> so that process is still uh, underway. So hopefully by the time if there is a consortium collection, that process will have been ironed out and that'll be easier for you guys as well. Uh, and that is about it on our show, but I'm assuming it has questions.
traditionally published uh, streams that we're used to dealing with with our ebook collections. And there's also the issue of the library as a place that supports um, the development of local writing and publishing. We are a place where local writers come to read books and get inspiration, to find space to write. And then now at BPL, we're lucky to be a place where people can come and work on their ebook manuscripts. Um, we run a lot of events where they can meet each other, launch their books. The piece that's missing is when they come to us and say, I want my self-published ebook to be in your collection. How can I do that? And right now, it's a pretty difficult process. Um, so that's part of why we're looking at this now. <laughs> so in the last few months, I've done a lot of background research on what options are out there for libraries. I'm going to go over a few of the platforms that we've been looking at um, and just give you some sort of pros and cons, similar to what Chris did earlier. Um, maybe a little less rah-rah than what Chris did earlier, <laughs> although there is some really interesting stuff going on here. So what I've been trying to keep in mind as I've been doing this research is that there are really these three kind of overlapping and competing priorities going on. We've got readers who want a wide variety of quality content that's constantly refreshed from all areas of the writing world. We have writers in our communities as well as internationally who want to get their books into our collection, increase their exposure, and also be compensated for their work just the way they are in print. And then we also have librarians who have existing workflows that have worked really well for us for a long time in terms of finding, selecting, collecting these books. And we want to be able to incorporate this new content into those workflows. Um, those three things sometimes mesh really nicely and sometimes don't, as we'll see when we look at some of these platforms. Um, so the front runner for us right now, as we're looking at the options, um, is Odillo. It was mentioned earlier um, as a pretty big player in the Spanish-speaking world, but they're also um, increasingly becoming a player in library uh, self-published ebook collections as well. So this is, uh, plat this is the Odillo platform. This is the uh, State Library of Australia. And you can see they've got a mix here of fiction, uh, literary magazines that are published locally. They've got new editions. They've got, okay, so local history books. They've got a whole mix here, and um, they're featuring them based on the decisions of the individual library. So Odilo uh, is a platform kind of similar in shape to Overdrive. Uh, they have a one-time implementation fee and then a sliding scale after that of per checkout fees based on titles that you've purchased and added to your collection. Um, they have Smashwords integration currently underway and I'm gonna go into Smashwords in just a minute and talk a little more about what that is for people who might not be super familiar. Um, but that's really the crux of their self-published content. They also have a lot of traditionally published content available in their marketplace, including a lot of uh, Canadian content, they've got nine e-bound partners, uh, as well as a lot of French and Spanish content too, so we're looking at it in the self-published lens, but they do have traditional content as well. There's a mix of license types available, and then the really exciting stuff is um, we have the ability to upload content ourselves, so we could be purchasing ebook manuscripts directly from local authors and uploading those titles into the collection, as well as our own EPUBs of city materials, of library materials. The Book Camp Anthology is now being turned into an ebook every year at BPL. Uh, we've got meeting minutes, newsletters, any local ebook content that's donated or sold to us by the community, literary magazines, et cetera. That could all be part of this collection. <laughs> uh, the site's pretty customizable, as you can see. And then they give us complete control over licensing and DRM of any content that we upload. So in Overdrive, you can choose a lot of things about the licensing terms when you upload a book directly, but it is still going to have DRM. In Odilo, that doesn't have to be the case. Um, we also have total control over the creation and editing of mark records for anything that's in the collection, whether we've uploaded it or not. Um, and they offer a pretty wide choice of authentication methods. So in theory, and we'll test this, um, you can just do barcodes, similar to what was being talked about with 3M. And then the content also belongs to us once we purchased it, so it's totally transferable to other platforms. Um, not everything is rosy with Odillo. Uh, batch uploading of EPUBs is still in development that hasn't rolled out yet, so you can imagine if you purchased a bunch of books or a big backlog of a local magazine, um, that batch uploading is going to be really useful and it's not there yet. Uh, they also don't have tools in place for curation or selection, so when it comes to 
assessing the quality and um, potential popularity of those self-published ebooks, those tools are not there. It's similar to Overdrive, but just the sort of different sections um, by popularity and by genre. And their marketplace doesn't have an advanced search, um, but it does have comprehensive filters for search results. Uh, so we're definitely going to be doing some more testing with Odolo, but it's kind of our front runner right now. So I'll talk about Smashwords. How many people have heard about Smashwords? Most of the people in the room, but not everybody, okay. Um, I have heard about it until I started this project. Spelling correctly in front of people, I guess. Um, so this is Smashwords. It's a pretty no frills looking site, but it's a pretty interesting project. So it's a web-based service that's used by hundreds of thousands of independent authors and independent publishers from all over the world. Um, authors or small presses can create an account, which is free, and then upload or create through the tools on the site um, an EPUB or other files for other uh, retail partners and set a price for that book. So all these books you see here, they got into this collection just by an author creating a free account, uploading an EPUB, setting a price. Um, what's neat about them though is they have this service called Smashwords Premium which although it's called premium, it doesn't actually cost the author anything up front. Um, and yeah, there's some interesting ones in here. My favorite one that I've found so far, full digression, is this book set in Vancouver in the 1970s about a homosexual detective, and it's called The Gay Dick. It's my new favorite book. <laughs> um, so all of these titles that are directly available on Smashwords, they might be in premium, they might not. If a book meets the formatting requirements of the Smashwords Premium Marketplace, um, which is really just this rigorous set of, is there a cover image, is there um, proper formatting of the front matter and back matter, does it meet basic formatting requirements to sort of work on an e-reader, um, all of that sort of stuff, then those titles are also included in the marketplace that Smashwords offers to their retail partners. And this is iVotes, Barnes & Noble, uh, Scribe, Kobo, Overdrive, Access 360, Odillo. Odillo is currently onboarding them, but they will be there. Um, and so all of those uh, retail partners have direct access to the roughly 300,000 titles that are currently in Smashwords Premium. Um, there's about another 100,000 that don't meet those rigorous formatting criteria, but they're still accessible directly on the site. Um, and then within their accounts, Authors can manage what their, uh, see what their sales are like in those different areas, um, manage which of those different marketplaces they decide to put their book into. So it puts a lot of the power and also the responsibility in the hands of the author. And really all we have to do is come along into Overdrive or Odillo and uh, find the book in the marketplace and purchase it. The rest of it is done on the author's end. Um, so speaking of Overdrive, the Overdrive um, Marketplace, and I won't bring it up here in the interest of time, but some of you have probably seen the self-published shop drop-down in the Overdrive Marketplace. That now has access to all of these Smashwords Premium titles. Um, they have some other self-published content in there as well, but it is the vast majority of it coming from Smashwords. So Overdrive is another option that we have looked at for this as well. It's a safer option in some ways. Our users are already familiar with the Overdrive borrowing process. Um, we already have the integration of Overdrive records into our catalog. <coughs> but again, there's that lack of control over whether there's DRM. The keyword searching isn't as good, which some of you may have experienced in the Overdrive marketplace as it is in Odillo and some of these other systems. Um, and they also have no batch uploading of EPUBs and no curation aspect, so no sort of, these are the highlighted best of the best titles. Uh, which brings me to BiblioBoard, which I know the co-op has also been offering some information about recently too, and Ron is going to talk about it in detail, but I'll just kind of set it up here. So they do have a public site now that I can show, and it is... Can I? Oh, is this going to give me a link to the public? Nope, it should just pop in. Aha, there we go. Take a look. Okay, so this is another option that we've looked at. Um, we've ended up at VPL leaning away from this towards the more open system of Odillo, but 
there are some interesting things about Bedway and Warden, and Ryan will get into them in a bit more detail. The big thing about them, and you probably heard about this in the last year or so, is they've been working with the Library Journal Editorial Board on this program called Selfie, um, which essentially is library journal folks reading a lot of the self-published content and highlighting what they consider the best of the best and creating modules for libraries to choose from based on that. Um, so it does save some of that selections and assessment work. Um, they also organize a lot of their content into regional modules. So if you're looking for local content or for content from specific regions, they've got that. Um, they offer all of their titles uh, unlimited simultaneous use which the more I looked into it was really this kind of double-edged sword of that's great we love offering unlimited simultaneous use like Nadine was saying about Hoopla but then when we think about the authors the fact that there in this model isn't any compensation up front at all and then that title is also simultaneously available to everyone in the world who has a Biblia board account there's there's two sides to that I think um, there are mark records available for Biblia board titles um, but I'll get into a few of the cons that we saw, and I think in some ways these are very unique to the kind of collection that we want to build, which is a little different than the BiblioWork collection that's been built at uh, GDPL. So their collection is quite small. There's under 4,000 titles um, in the self-published area of BiblioBoard right now, and less than 60 of those are from Canadian authors. Contrasting that with the 300,000 that are available through Smashwords Premium, it's a pretty big difference. Um, the compensation model is something that we really stopped at uh, because we'd be buying more than just local content that authors might want to donate to us anyway. We really want to be uh, selecting from that whole wide world of self-published content that we know our readers already have an appetite for. And we want to be doing that uh, with an eye to the compensation that those independent authors are getting. Um, and then. The issue of not owning content was one that stopped us as well when we looked at BiblioBoard. You do have to pay an additional um, purchase price at the end of your relationship with them if you want to retain titles. Um, and then finally, and I think this is one also that was um, more important to us than it might be in other situations because we really want our self-published collection to be um, not just those local titles, but this collection that merges quite nicely with the rest of our ebook collections, the reading experience is a little different in BiblioBoard. Um, to read offline, you have to use their app, so there is no like downloading an EPUB and reading it on an e-reader. Um, that said, the Selfie program makes it really interesting, and what has been done at GBPL is very interesting too, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about that. So I'll just wrap up my piece of this by saying, um, we are leaning towards these more open systems of Odello and Overdrive, but that is going to mean that we're going to have to think about some other issues in-house at VPL, and hopefully they can be part of our conversations this afternoon too. We're going to need to discuss what we mean by local or locally relevant content, and also discuss whether our formatting or content criteria for collecting these books is going to be different based on whether they are locally relevant or not. Um, but we're really excited to have an answer for those authors who want to donate their books to us, sell their books to us, become part of this library ecosystem that they already love. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Ryan now to provide another perspective and actually give us a look at what a bibliophore collection looks like. And then I'll be around for questions at the end. Yes, don't leave. <laughs> okay. Can everybody hear me without a mic or do I need a mic? Need a mic? Okay. I'll wear the microphone, Sarah says I must. Um, so I think for us, we were looking for something slightly different. Our needs were a bit unique. Um, we were almost really looking more for a content management system that would allow us to loan things to people than we were um, an ebook platform. Um, I'm just going to pop to our collection as I'm talking. How can you tell me the map person? Hopefully, you can go back. Nice. Good call. Um, so, <laughs> no? Wait, is there a mouse attached? Or no, it just is a tap, right? Ah. Click. Feel the feeling. Feel it. Did anybody see that Modern Family recently where it was double? You <laughs> <laughs> saw that? There we go. It's on a tap. It's, like, it's, it's like attached. Layer. Yeah. Okay. So, will that work or do we need to go to your front end? Yes. I, I would think about it. 
Okay, there we go. Um, while I'm doing this, I'm just going to say that what we have done, um, we were dealing with a lot of the same thing. In Victoria, there's a lot of authors, like a lot of authors. Um, and they really love the library and they really want to be part of it. And so one of the things that we started encountering was in the beginning, it wasn't really great and we were saying no. Um, then the content started getting better, not all of it. Um, but we really, we had a, a day one day where we were sort of complaining as we were doing pretty much weekly. Oh my God, I'm having to talk to another author and their stuff is not great and they really want it to be in the library. And, it's, and this time it was some horrible story like this woman's grandmother had died and the last thing she wanted was to have her book in the library. And the book was like hand-drawn pictures of cats with poetry this woman had written inspired by recipes that her grandma used to make. It was horrible. It was horrible. Like, you would look at this book and be like, I, I never want to look at it. But how do you tell someone that? So we were kind of having this conversation as we were doing almost weekly. Um, and with my senior collections librarian. And I finally I looked at her, because you know we were both right in it. And I said, I'm starting to think, like we talked about this last week, we talked about the week before, I'm starting to think we're the problem. Because if we're having this conversation over and over about our patrons, we're not wrong. A lot, of, like some of these books are great and some of them are garbage. But if we're having this conversation over and over and we're having the same frustration with our patrons, maybe it's us. So that's where we kind of ended up deciding we were going to do an emerging local authors collection. And our sort of joking but not really catchphrase is, we're allowed to say yes. And basically what we did is we said, we're going to do this. We're going to take your books for one year. You're going to donate them to us so that we don't have to spend any money on them. So that we don't have to explain to taxpayers in some cases why we bought a book with hand-drawn pictures of kittens that don't look like cats based on someone's grandmother's recipes. <laughs> but what we're going to do, because maybe, to be honest, 20% are that. Then probably another 50% are not bad. And then there's probably another, what does that leave me with, 30% that are actually quite good. Um, so we said, anybody who wants to be part of this can. We'll take your book for one year. We're going to put it in our collection. It's going to be a real part of our collection. We're going to fully catalog it. We're, in fact, going to put special foil seal on it. It's going to be in pride of place where we normally only keep things like Grisham and Ivanovich on a special <laughs> shelving thing that we bought. We're going to brand it as local. We're going to have a party for you after the library is closed in the library. So you get to be part of the group. Um, and we're going to celebrate you. And we're going to promote you. We're going to have stuff on our website. Um, so we did that. This is all leading up to something, trust me. Um, so the first year we only did print because we were like, Lord knows we have no, many people, no idea how many people there are going to be, and we don't know whether they're ebook people or not, and let's just start small. Um, so we did, but one of the questions we got was, what about ebooks? And I was concerned about it because I felt like, well, if we're insisting it has to be print, then we're still kind of insisting you have to have the money to create a print book. Because one of our rules was it can't be a bunch of pieces of paper stapled together because it does circulate and it'll get destroyed the first time it goes through a book drop. No. <laughs> so we said, you know, like book books, although we're still pretty flexible about that as well. Um, so the, sec the thing we really wanted for the second year, which just launched in May, was to have ebooks. So when we were looking for something, we weren't so much looking for content, and we were already having our authors donate their books. So that wasn't a problem, and it really never had been. I think our focus really was on local, and you guys know it's usually all you can do to keep a local author from donating 30 or 40 copies of their book for your three branches, 10 for each branch, right? So that wasn't a problem. What they wanted was the value added that we could give them, which was on our website and key pride of place and that kind of promotion that they otherwise don't get, they get lost and nobody grows them, they're great. So we were looking for flexibility, something that was pretty simple to use for a patron and really simple for us. We wanted a lot of control, and we wanted potential to use it in other ways in the future, um, because we've been talking about things like uh, doing a digital local music, so we wanted different forums, because um, again, we have physical local music, but what we're finding is there's tons of free local digital music, it's not all brought together, so we'd like to be that. Um, we, interestingly, although we were excited about Selfie, we haven't started using it yet, we're doing an overall privacy review as an organization, and so it didn't really make sense to jump into doing selfie uh, when our privacy has, officer has some questions about it until the overall privacy review is done and we move ahead with a bunch of different things at once. 
So we did it. We created a collection. Our original local authors this year had, I think, 172 books in it. Uh, 69 of them are ebooks. Only about 17 of those are ebook only. The rest are print, but that's 17 local authors who wouldn't have been part of our collection otherwise. Um, overall, I think the thing we were happiest about, and those who do trials and then buy digital products will probably know what I mean by this. You know how sometimes you buy something and you're still not 100% sure what you're buying? And you just kind of hope it's gonna work. Even if you do trials, you never really know until you dig in and you're one month in and you suddenly discover, oh, I didn't know that. So we've been really happy because overall, what we thought we were getting is what we got. Don't worry, I don't have that much of where to go actually. Um, customer service and support has been amazing. They're really responsive, which we left. Um, it is really easy to use, it's easy to control. Uploading stuff is easy, and we do that for our patrons, because a lot of them can't do it, and the whole point for us was to say, yes, you could send us the file, we'll deal with it. Um, it takes about eight to 10 minutes to upload each book, including doing metadata and everything. Um, they approved the content, because they do a quick sort of quality control really quickly. The app is pretty good. The stats are excellent. Um, the only real challenge we could find with it in terms of the way we're using it is that you have to highlight things and we didn't really want to highlight any particular authors. Um, ways we think we might use it in the future, local music collection, um, videos by our team council, they're already creating them, digitized local and history content. We've also had community partners who've wanted us in the past to um, host digital collections for them and we haven't been able to do that, this will allow us to. Um, and they do a really cute community engagement spotlight, and they did ours, so it's on Vimeo if you want to look at it. And it's this girl, she's super enthusiastic about what we're doing, which is kind of fun. Um, and it's a, a cute little marketing thing that we were able to tweet out. Um, yeah, so overall pretty easy and pretty responsive. And so maybe Sam will come back up so if you have questions, yeah, you can ask me if you have any questions. Oh, there's so, no questions. No questions. Um, because we're a little tight on time, and we are going to have uh, self-publishing as one of our breakout sessions. Um, so these two will be part of that breakout session. Um, I'm telling them that now, uh, so they can, you can talk to them um, and discuss that with them at the um, during the breakout sessions. Okay. Awesome. Okay. So for our last talk before our break. Um,